the good. All the spiritual gifts are necessary or given for the building of the church or being necessary in terms of they're used in, as tools and, uh, and gifts so that the church can fulfill its uh, uh, the command of Jesus Christ in building up and, uh, and bringing people to the knowledge of the, of the gospel of the one true God, of his Christ, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit that continues to abide with us as his people. And so that common good is to make sure that these gifts are following through. That's how we can kind of tell good or bad, or if they're really truly uh, having the gifts of the spirit, right? Um, and he goes further when he characterizes these endowments or these giving of these, uh, the handing of these gifts or providing these gifts. He says, first, according to the general characteristics of them. So then the specifics, he's giving them generalities in the sections four through 11. First, it's the spiritual gifts um, uh, that he talks about. Uh, and the Greek is the charismata. And these are the power, powers and abilities that come from outside oneself. So like the gifts of healing, these spiritual gifts. <clears throat> Are given to are, are seen as ways of having this uh this uh ability or these powers that are able to do these um miraculous or supernatural things right so and then this other gift of serving um he uses the word uh, diakonia that's why we get the word deacon uh means someone uh, who is humble and it's it's a less dramatic like a miraculous kind of use of the spirit uh, it's meeting the needs of mankind or meeting the human needs. So being charitable and helpful to people. That's an, also another gift of the spirit to be able to um, uh, to uh, to serve each one, right? And then there are these workings uh, of the spirit. So then these are also like like the spirit gifts are more supernatural activities. These are workings of miracles, workings of powers, and having these supernatural faith, right? And all these gifts or endowments are given uh, equally by the triune God, and they're one and the same spirit, are given by the one same spirit, not specific, uh, certain, and there's no specific gift by, like, certain gifts given by the Father, certain gifts by the Son, or certain gifts by the Holy Spirit. Just like we, as a church, we know that as, as much as we know it's been revealed that we believe in the, the, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we still call them as, we know them, we'll know him as the one true God, right? And so when they're acting, so we can kind of maybe see, like, you know, Jesus Christ, we can see him. He's the one that's uh, suffering and dying and all those things uh, and, and resurrecting. Um, but we know that he's always, uh, uh, his will is always in concert or in, in communion or in union with the Father and the Spirit, right? So in a similar way, we talk, talks about the giving of these gifts. As much as we, you know, we kind of highlight it, it's the Holy Spirit that's coming down and empowering us uh, as the faithful with these uh, gifts of the Spirit. We should never think it's only the spirits or the only the son's gifts or the only the the father's gifts. Um, it's the one the, that's what it says in verse eleven. The one and the same spirit works on all these things, distributing distributing to each one individually as he wills. Right, and then when we go further, when he talks about the specific gifts, we see the words of wisdom, and these are the divinely given insights. Sorry, insight necessary to explain. God's saving mystery, right? So these words of wisdom, <coughs> excuse me, these words of wisdom uh, are the ability to interpret scriptures and it's a gift given to um, teachers to be able to uh, to explain and to teach, you know, and that's hopefully all of us as we continue in these Bible studies and studying the scriptures on our own, you know, given that, that ability to be able to, you know, express the faith of the church, right? And to teach us like we teach our kids in Sunday school, or we do like in, in, as adults and uh, studying the scriptures and studying the faith of the church, or when we're given the opportunity, uh, when we're just one-on-one -on -one with somebody who maybe is not knowing the Christian faith at all, those who might know, but there are, 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 are in need of some more uh, strengthening or needing some more understanding of what the church teaches or what the faith teaches us as Christians. And so this words of wisdom is a gift of the spirit, right? And that's in verse eight. Um, so that we can uh, provide uh, that insight, right, uh, of the divine saving mysteries. And then it goes, the words of knowledge. And this is the response required by men uh, to the saving acts of God. So understanding how to act ethically and how God would want us to respond. So this words of knowledge is knowing specifically how we can act, at, what it says ethically, meaning in, in a moral way, right? So that we are knowing that 
mankind has the God has given us the ability to choose, you know, the freedom to choose what, you know, whichever uh, way we want, right? He doesn't force us to go one way or the other. Um, and so, uh, um, and so when we see this gifts of knowledge or this gifts to, uh, of knowledge or words of knowledge to act ethically and morally, it's knowing that to do the good, the way that we are, how we're deciding which way to go or how to act or what decision to follow is having the knowledge of how God wants us to, to act, thinking about where God wants me to, how God wants me to respond. So that's coming as words of knowledge. And these two gifts are, you'll always usually mention together. And so they're invested in teachers of the church, having the wisdom and the knowledge to explain and express and to show how we act in a, a Christ-like or godly way, right? In a divine way. And I just know that we did have a question and that's kind of from uh, earlier. We're talking about uh, the gifts of the spirit uh, of those who are um, serving. Uh, and then we ask, is the caregivers uh, to family or, family are considered a gift or only when you do charitable acts? No, all forms of, give, you know, of, of serving, uh, even in the, I, I would at least, my understanding, even in the most minimal, uh, like what seems like a small way, I feel like it's a gift of spirit di uh, directing us. And so uh, meeting the needs of our loved ones, right? Uh, and those who even more. So what, in one way we can say, it might not be given as a, uh, we might not see it as a gift of the spirit because we do that because out of love for them. They're part of, they're our husbands or our children, our, our wives or uh, parent, uh, friend or, you know, close cousin, whatever it might be. That's why that seem as such a uh, a dramatic way or like, you know, it's like a, I'm doing something great uh, or, or something that's I'm needing to be empowered to do. I do because I, I love them, right? But being mindful that we know that not all families have that in them or we might have discord or uh, division amongst even close family members. So it's really is part of that, 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 that spirit helping us to know to do, right? Because we know that even non-Christians, people who don't believe in the spirit, will do care, give care to those who are their family members, because that's kind of like the right thing to do. And we'll always, to a certain, a certain level, uh, we'll understand that that's kind of the how the imprint, you know, the imprint of God's image and likeness on us to know to do the good, because we have been created by the one true God, and and at a at a very basic and minimal level, our our, our body, minds, and souls know a, at least at a limited way what the good is because we've been created by the good God. He's created us in goodness. Though we have chosen to fall into sin and we have evil and sin around us, that guilt is never completely removed, right? And so uh, caring for our family member is, is it can be seen as a gift of the spirit uh, uh, because it's more than just, oh, I have to, or an obligation, but some, but some people might. And that's then I would say maybe it's not so much of a gift. You're feeling it out of obligation and expecting something in return, right? But truly, when we're doing it out of love, and, and because we know, uh, we and then the, we know the love that God has given to us, we can see that as a gift of the Spirit helping us and empowering us to uh, to provide that care for them, right, and for their health and their well-being. Especially, we know that when we do it for those who are not our family, those who are unknown to us, we can really see that's really, you know, going be uh, above and beyond, right, in providing that care, and so. That, and sometimes we don't know even how, like, uh, as people, even even as Azachins and lay people, we don't know how to help or respond to people who are suffering. Then we, when we pray, we ask, ask the Spirit to help us and strengthen us to be able to provide that care, by at least by our presence with them. We don't have to worry about the words. But if God, by the grace of God, if we have the, the Spirit of wisdom and knowledge and, and by given to us to help provide that good word to them, uh, that's always something that's a blessing and a gift of the Spirit. And as you go further down, when um, uh, when Saint Paul talks about the now going a little more specific about specific about the different uh, gifts of the Spirit, starting in verse nine, um, he talks about faith, and this faith is a supernatural faith that can move mountains, like he says later in chapter thirteen. But also when we think about Christ's words and the Gospels, he says when we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can move mountains, right? And that's taken from Saint Matthew seventeen. So it's not of the saving faith in Christ that is open to all of us, like, you know, that is open to, and those who are called to believe in faith that Jesus died and resurrected for salvation. That's the, you know, saving faith or the basic faith that all of us as Christians have. But the gift of faith is that supernatural faith that helps us to uh, know that God uh, empowers us to do and to serve as is fitting for the building of, of the kingdom of God on here on earth, right? So then like moving mountains, right? 
And so that's a gift of the spirit, having that faith. And then we have the gifts of healing. So this is a supernatural gift. You heal any number of various diseases. So, you know, a lot of uh, saints of the early church and even uh, to, you know, saints even, even to this day were able to pray uh, for the healing and well-being of those who are infirm because uh, are, are of various types of illnesses. And they're able to heal them by the grace of God uh, through the prayers and intercessions of our saints and those all here on earth who are continually praying for them. That's a gift of healing, right? And that's a gift of the spirit. And then the working of miracles, like casting out of demons or opening the eyes of the blind or raising the dead, like you read in the book of Acts of the Apostles and the other books of the scriptures. And when we read the lives of the different saints, uh, that's seen also as a gift of the spirit. His ability to work miracles is given to the faithful uh, for the ability, you know, for uh, meeting the needs at that moment uh, for the faithful and the church, right? As they're calling and praying for God's mercy and grace and healing upon uh, the, those who are having these different kinds of afflictions, right? And then they talks about he talks about the gift of prophecy. And like the Old Testament prophets, it says speaking the message from uh, that's given to us from God, right? Can be predictions of future events or, or messages to uplift and edify the faithful. So when we think about the different prophets like um, uh, Jeremiah or Isaiah, uh, in the Old Testament, or we think about St. John the Baptist uh, in the New Testament, you know, he's speaking for the coming of the, the kingdom of God and the, uh, and and and, uh, and um, a point, you know, he's saying the Lamb of God who takes with us in the world, recognizing who Christ is by, by as has been revealed uh, at the time of the baptism. Those are all uh, the ability to speak by the grace of the Spirit uh, to, uh, you know, to show God's, you know, uh, revealing God's will at that time, even we think about, like I forgot to mention, even St. John the Baptist, even the womb of his mother, when St. Mary came and visited uh, uh, her cousin, St. Elizabeth, and they're both, you know, with child in their wombs, says the Holy Spirit uh, came upon St. Elizabeth and it filled her son in the womb and he jumped for joy at the coming of the Savior, right? And so this is uh, the message of uplifting and edifying and recognizing even in the future that the child that is in now uh, incarnate in uh, taking form in the womb of St. Mary is the, is the coming Savior, uh, the Messiah, the Christ. So things like that are considered as, as gifts of prophecy given to us uh, by the uh, by God, right? And then there's the discerning spirits. And this seems to mention, as St. Paul's writing it, about individual prophecies. And this gift is a true prophecy that is able to discern and distinguish from false ones, right? So they're the, the ones who are able to see that Whoever is preaching or, or speaking a prophecy, uh, this discerning of the spirits is the gift needed to uh, screen out who are false prophets, uh, who are coming from outside the community, making sure that they're uh, the person who's speaking, saying oh, they received a message or gift from uh, of God. This gift of you know revealing something of God uh, is true by those who have the discerning uh, spirit. Going further, he talks about then goes about the speaking in tongues, tongues. And this is the ability to preach the gospel in a different language. And then it, tied to that is the interpretation of tongues, the ability to interpret the preaching of a tongue that is not known to the hearers. And it seems that St. Paul intentionally places this gift last uh, as to highlight for the Corinthian church or the people of Corinth, the church in Corinth, that th this is only one of many. Because like I said, one of the issues that's happening that St. Paul is sharing about and he's writing this epistle uh, there is this cliques that are forming based off those who can and those who don't speak in tongues. Uh, and that was being used as a sign of uh, of pride, right? Of, of those who can and those who can't, right? And so and so, uh, St. Paul puts at last so that people don't think that's the greatest or that that's only one of many different gifts that's given to us by the church, right? And so, and the portion of these gifts, the ease of the faithful is as God wills. The God wills is by God's will, who can do each one? I wonder what gifts he gives to them, right? And no one gift is more important. The more important is to have gratitude to God for whatever gift he chooses to give. And that's the, that's one of the key things that we have to be uh, very mindful of, um, that we have to be showing the gratitude uh, for the gift that he, he gives to all of us. So that's why in that verse 11, where he uh, St. Paul writes, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So it's highlighting for us as God wills and, and is seeing the necessity and need of the church at the time and using uh, the people as he so uh, desires 
and sees what, what's the best uh, for each person and each community uh, that's you know receiving and those who are I'm part, and be able to be blessed by that gift by that whatever that, that person with this, that gift is doing or are you how they're using it's this, how God chooses we trust that God is understanding what is truly uh, necessary and needed um, uh, at that time and at this moment that's why uh, that's what we can kind of understand. But, well, you know, certain gifts now, like speaking in tongues, are not as much highlighted uh, to this day, uh, current day, right? Part of it's because it's based on the need of the church. Gifts of tongues will be there when there's a need, right? That's for preaching the gospel in language maybe you might not understand or, or being able to speak in, in ways that we don't discount that that's not a, that can't happen. But we know it's always meant, like we said in the beginning, uh, for the common good, for the, ne the necessity of building up the kingdom of God here on earth, right? With, uh, without that as the focus and the foundation of this, the use of these gifts, then they have no meaning, which St. Paul will talk more when we uh, speak next time uh, about in uh, chapter 13, right? The, about the greatest of all the things. It doesn't matter if, how much strength and power we get from these gifts, right? But we'll talk about that uh, next time. So the next we get then to how he uh, gives the analogy, how we can understand all these different gifts. And that's found in... Um, at the verses 12 through um, 26. And if someone can just read the first handful of verses from verses um, 12 through, um, uh, let me see, from 12 to uh, 21. Thanks, Rishon. Same uh, from 12, chapter 12, verses 12, verses 12 through just 21 for right now. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. You can stop here. Thank you. Uh, um, so when you see uh, St. Paul, I'm um, sorry, uh, in this next section of, of chapter 12, he's using the analogy of the many members uh, making up the one body. And so we know that in later in, in different epistles, we talk about the Church is the uh, uh, part of Christ, right? He's the head, and we are the body, right? And so, and so, uh, with that understanding, he's using that uh, when we look understanding the different varieties and multiple gifts of the Spirit that's given to us by the God. Uh, he's reminding first and foremost the unity of all the different parts are are are, are necessary for the need of the one body, right? And he reminds us first and foremost that we have been all been baptized into that one body. So we all share the same gift of receiving the Holy Spirit uh, at the time of our baptisms and then the receiving uh, the sacrament of chrismation or the Holy Muron that's anointed over us. That is a, all of us are receiving that, right? All of us equally when we're coming into the church, receiving um, that same baptism into the one body, be, be a Jewish, a Jews or Greek, as he says, slave or free. All have been made uh, in, uh, to drink into the one spirit in fact, the body is not one member, but many, right? So the body, as we said, the body is made of many parts, but we still make up the one body, just like we can visualize of ourselves, right? There's many parts, but we're still one person. And no one part is greater than the other. That's where we get the next part. Uh, they all work together. We can't all, you know, can't be all eye, can't be all hand, um, right? It can't be all just ear or nose, right, for smelling. They all work in concert uh, together or in, in union together. And there's a mutual care and equality. There's no division amongst uh, this uh, 
uh, this, these parts, right? And if there's anything that's hurting, they'll all be suffering, right? We'll all feel that that pain, right? And so uh, we have to be very mindful of that, right? So that this first this first section of Bowen 26 is highlighting we're all one body, uh, but many members, right? And all of us have been baptized into the one body in Jesus Christ, and we partake of the same drink, meaning we all see the same kurbana, right? Uh, each, every, you know, especially when we first become baptized, and then at every kurbana so that we partake of, uh, participate in, where we're receiving of the one drink, you know, the one body and blood of Jesus Christ, the same spirit that joins us together as a worshiping community. So we can't say one is greater than the other. He's trying to really highlight the 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 message that we shouldn't be dividing inside the church based off of whatever it might be. In this case, it's about the use of the spirits, right? And so we have to be very um, mindful and cognizant of that, right? And so then um, when we look at uh, the next section of this portion, if someone can read verses 21 through 26 for me, please. 21, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, <clears throat> having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Okay, thank you, Prithi. So we see in this uh, section... He's continuing on this analogy about how we understand us as many different people or parts, you know, members of the body of the one body of Jesus Christ. Um, he's now going into individual parts about um, of how we, you know, about divisions, right? Because this is we know that as we're studying this uh, First Corinthians, that is the big issue that Saint Paul is trying to um, to correct and to heal uh, for this church community, right? And so when he's using this analogy, which is kind of very a very nice visual because we can all uh understand because we can just look at ourselves in the mirror or look at one another all the different parts of what is that a very it's a very intimate uh at the same time very uh, uh easily accessible image that saint paul is using and so but he highlights you know you know we can't all just be i uh, and say i have no hand of you or in the or the hand cannot i cannot say the hand i have no need of you because then we can't pick up things or the feet can't say uh, i have no need of you right and so he's reminding us even our body parts, we understand if one uh, is suffering, we all suffer. If you have a headache, and it's just really our brain, you know, our head is hurting, but our whole body feels the ex experiences it. Or if our hand is hurting, you know, as we know, just when thinking, uh, learn, you know, biology, the pain is up as well, all that our brain and the, our whole body is kind of able to uh, experience it or understand that it's hurting, right? Though even though the eye is not feeling the, the same pain as the hand, but the eye is suffering because the hand is feeling that pain, right? And so that is a, a very intimate kind of way of St. Paul is reminding us that when we're causing these divisions, they should be feeling like that. When they're, they're, they're separating or thinking, I can cut off this person because they're not like me, or they're not part like, you know, speaking in, in this case, speaking tongues like me, then you're hurting your own self, right? And so that is one uh, uh, part of this section that he's highlighting. We shouldn't be when we're causing the divisions. Where it's like we're cutting off a hand, uh, you know, which we know in the very extreme cases, you know, people get uh, body parts amputated because of, you know, uh, infection, right? And you have to cut things off. But even though that's not the ideal thing, we, the body will continue to suffer or have uh, have to endure that suffering. They they can move forward with a level, but it, they'll know that that part is missing, your leg, your foot, or hand, or whatever it might be, right? Um, so you know that's not the ideal. We want to be made whole, you know, we want to be wholly, uh, uh, not meaning double, like as a part whole, be able to come before God, right? And that God makes us holy, like uh, sanctified, because that he's indwelling in us, that he, whatever uh, we are lacking, we know that he can uh, provide, but at the same time, we, we have to do everything in our power and our ability 
uh, in our faith and belief in the one true God, that we are always um, submitting uh, 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 completely and sufficiently before him, never looking to cause division amongst ourselves, but looking to know that we are all together. But that at the same time, he gave it goes a little, he takes even another layer when he talks about this idea about the different parts, not just about you know division in terms of like uh, I cannot say I don't need I have no need of you. He even though it goes in verses that verses twenty three onwards, he says, and those members uh, of the body which we think are less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the that part which lacks it, right? So He's then saying. So sometimes we think about body parts. We might kind of in our mind think there's some that are more important. Like you know, we can imagine hands and feet. That's we that's what we use. Uh, that's what we use in the beginning analogy. We might think they are more important because that's how our body is able to do things. We're able to work. We're able to go places. We're able to move things because of our hands and our feet. And we think those are the more, and that everyone can see them. At the same time, our facial features, our eyes, our nose, our ears, our mouths, you know, all of our senses are kind of, you know, particularly we think about in our, on our heads, we think of them having more um, honor or, or greater responsibility or not responsibility, greater uh, position in terms of the di many different parts, which they have greater functions or uh, in greater in terms of it does certain things that are more used. Um, but then uh, he says about the, the parts that we cover or the unpresentable parts, those that we see that we all use very sparingly, we have to cover up, you know, be it like, you know, we, we wear clothes and we have to care, cover our private parts. And then we think, oh, those are maybe not as honored. And, and to say that we honor, we have modesty. We, we understand certain things about how God created us and how we're called to move forward in Christ. But he's highlighting all this part. Like, we know that there's different, you know, if you use this analogy, we can make it say that many different things. So, well, why are certain things not used as regularly or, or more submitted to other uh, to others, right? But then he's highlighting those, even those parts receive greater honor. Why? Because just as, as one, if one part of the body is suffering, all the suffering, like we talked about earlier, when one part is glorified or honored, the entire person is glorified, right? So even the parts that we might hide, you know, we have to cover up, as he's saying, might be not seen as as honorable as others, but when one, the part that is honored, right? Uh, the whole body, you know, we don't say, oh, the hand is giving, getting the uh, the um, award or, you know, like in a sporting race or when there's these track, you know, these um, sporting events like we, he used analogy earlier, you know, when they put a crown on the head of the people or a medal, we think a medal around the neck, it, that's not the only part that's getting honored. The whole person is being uplifted and glorified. I mean, we know it's the whole person. You can't sub cut the parts out the only that part is honorable. The whole body part participates or receives the glory. That's why he's he's saying um, they're all uh, are sharing. Uh, uh, just like they all, they all share in the suffering, they all share in the of uh, the honor and rejoice in it. That's what we see. So when we see somebody is uh, be able to have a great gift, we we rejoice. That's why they, that's Saint Paul is you know part of it's been something like he's been. Of bashing or kind of putting down or kind of correcting more the people who speak in tongues, saying to people who are against them, he say, hey, you know, don't just uh, attack. Uh, you should rejoice it when there's a good word being said, right? So he's talking to both sides and and you and using this analogy of the body because without it, he knows that then there will always continue to be divisions, right? And there continue to be a uh, breakdown of uh, the body of Christ, right? And so he's reminding us that this, this analogy of Biden uh, is, is a good one because it shows us and highlights for us the, 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 show, the necessity that we rely on one another, just as we will all rely on uh, the grace and mercies of God, right? God has empowered us and given us uh, by his grace and mercy and by his, uh, you know, the, the, the image like that he's placed on all, uh, upon all of us. We're all are called to use it together uh, for uh, the whole body of the of christ which is the church right so the body of the church is is to function as one united and mutually uh dependent whole right they're all functioning together uh and, and, and uh suffering when we all suffer and we'll also rejoice and rejoice as uh and, and be able to build up together we all share in that and we should be um uh 
appreciative of that. And we should also be mindful of that, right? As a church and as a people, right? And then we get to the last section of uh, this chapter 12. And somebody can just read those, those last verses of verses 27 through 31. Thank you, please. And anyone can read, please. Just those last five, like five, six verses. Now you, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, help, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts? And yet I show you a more excellent way. Thank you, Pretty. So sure. here now um, we see, uh, you know, like I said earlier, he, it wasn't necessarily put in any particular order of the gifts that he wrote. You know, he was writing down, but he did put speaking tongues last. Uh, the, we said it highly just to show that that's not the only one, right? But in the same way now, he now puts this uh, transition, this application of the gifts of the spirit from, you know, analogy of the body. Now he's putting, applying it to actual work of the church, right? And now he's putting a hierarchy of function, right? That he puts first, second, third. He's putting an order to them, right? And he still puts uh, the tongues uh, near the end, right? Uh, at the end of this list. But when we start looking at it uh, very specifically, when he begins, he first says apostles, right? And we understand that when we look at the early church or the scriptures, the apostles are the ones who are sent by Christ to preach the gospel, right? And we can see it directly as Christians when we read the scriptures and we read particularly the gospels. We understand after Christ, after him, we see it's the apostles who are the most closest to Jesus Christ, right? They are the ones who have been entrusted to uh, uh, preach what he has taught to them, right? And so he sends them out to uh, give the message, right? But it doesn't end with them. Then it continues on. <clears throat> so uh, the apostles, uh, the function or the uh, hierarchy of apostles doesn't end with just the 12. So then, you know, we have their disciples who are the trust. So as a church, we understand that even to this day, the apostles uh, of today are the bishops. They're in the line of the apostles. That's why, you know, in our church, you know, we recently had the, the rally in Carroll about the, you know, the highlighting the martyrdom of St. Paul, uh, St. Thomas coming to India and being martyred in, in India, uh, celebrating the, I think, the, um, 19 like 1950 years like almost close to 2000 years we're highlighting of christ um coming uh to india and preaching the gospel and we said we understand that our bhavati is in the line of saint peter uh, and even though they, uh we might uh, um dispute is he really a direct line can we show like a complete hundred you know like so much line like some churches do will can show uh or will do like are you in our church well a list of many different theories of Tie you all the way back to St. Thomas, which goes to then from Christ. Uh, but it reminds us that St. Paul says this hierarchy of functions of the gifts to uh, apply uh, in the functioning of the church, right? That's what we talk about is for the common good. It begins with the apostles, right? They're, and because their function is to preserve and to preach uh, the gospel, which means specifically not just, you know, what we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but being upholders of all that Christ had taught to them, right? We know that as St. John even writes in his uh, gospel in chapter 20, like he says, he didn't write all the things that Jesus Christ had written, or sorry, had taught them and done. He, he wrote all of those things so that we can believe that he is the Christ and that he is the Savior and that we might have faith and, believe, faith and belief in him, right? That's why the gospel is very specific to get us to know and to believe in Jesus Christ. But there's other things that he taught them that is necessary for the building of the church. And so those things are been handed down faithfully by the apostles, right? And so they, and it keeps going down. So these apostles are, are sent to preach the gospel. Like I said, it's not just uh, only what we read in the New Testament and the four gospels. It's all the, the fullness of all that Christ had entrusted uh, to them for the church, right? Which is his, like we've been talking, which is his body. Then next comes the um, apostles, oh, sorry, the prophets. And those who are called to speak his word and inspire believers to follow it, right? The prophets are mean like the 
uh, or like we can we can equate also as evangelists, right? The people who are called to uh, speak and inspire, right? And so that that's a gift uh, of the spirit, so that the church can continue to fulfill its uh, its role and its ministry and spreading the good news to the ends of the earth, right? So those are not necessarily or specifically only uh, the the ordained ministers, and because that is saying when it says this prophets there are people who have been inspired, who have been called to make and speak his words. And like I say, it's, and, it, and as a church, we know it's not just speaking, it's also through their actions. So we would like we know a lot of saints who are not even, who are not even uh, necessarily ordained, but they, you know, especially when you think of the women saints, they're not necessarily considered ordained ministry, but we call them as saints because they, ins they speak his word and they inspire others to believe and follow after Jesus Christ. Right. And so those are the, the spirit uh, or the gift of being a prophet. And the next one then is teachers, right? They're tasked to uh, catechize or to teach the faithful, explaining the scriptures of the gospel, right? So it's the ability to make sure that people <clears throat> can understand and know what it means to be a Christian, right? And that's what even St. Paul's doing now, right? He is making sure they understand the faith that has been handed to them, explaining to them the scriptures, and explaining to them the message, the true message of the gospel. And that's the work of the teachers. So we can say that's why in the order. The sent to preach the gospel, those who are called to speak his word, and rest that make sure to teach that word. And then comes like the 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 uh, the bigger things like the you know like we even when we look at the the gospels, you know, even Christ was getting um uh, uh mindful that you know the people are just now thronging to see him because they're wanting to see something amazing. They're the 15 minutes of fame kind of thing. They want to see Jesus do these great signs, right? And they're asking for a sign. That's even Jesus gets annoyed with a lot of the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the people asking, we want to see a sign. He said, there's only one sign that's given to you, going to be given to you, the sign of Jonah, right? As he was in the belly of the whale for three days, so shall the Son of Man uh, be and resurrect, right? And come up, right? And so, and so this, uh, that's what it comes later. After that, it's not just the, after the actual teaching and preaching uh, of the gospel and the word of God, then comes healings, which is a gift to heal the sick of their various diseases. Because that's a necessary thing to help, because we know Jesus Christ himself even did many miracles of healing, uh, like we especially during this Lenten season. There's a lot of the uh, gospel readings for the Sunday uh, readings are about the, these healings that Jesus has done, these signs. So it, it is a, an important work, but it's not the great, it's not one of the greatest ones. It's not considered up there with being preaching the gospel and uh, speaking his word and teaching, right? But it's a, it is a part of the ministry of the church and healing of the people. And then we get the helps, right? The gift of giving charitably and to aid the needy, right? So it's not that this is less important, but show that then we have to be mindful. We have to help one another and be charitable and provide for the need as part of uh, our responsibility as a faithful uh, members of the church, uh, as faithful Christians, we have to help. And that's a, but that we know that desire is not always in us directly, but that we know that by the gift of, and, and the working of the spirit uh, and, the, and God working in us, that helps us to really to do to uh, strive to do those things. And then we get uh, the administration that he talks about. And that's specifically you know, like the uh, the gift of guiding and leading the church. And we you know, particularly in our church, that's the, like the ordained ministers, uh, being the bishops and the priests who are in charge of administering the church, both teaching and preaching the gospel, but also responsible for the administrative needs of uh, conducting uh, the business of the church in terms of not like the money, specific money, so when I say business, but you know, uh, the functioning of the church, make sure uh, the orderliness of the the, the liturgies or the kurbanas, and make sure the the services are being done regularly. Make sure the people are understanding and coming, and making sure all those uh, um, like the tedious things that we think about are being done. And then finally, it ends with the tongues, preaching the message in the different languages, so that as a the gospel message is being spread out to the word throughout the world, we get uh, the the ability to make sure that the message is being uh, preached to what so the people the, to the people who can understand or listening right so even if it's a language that's you know unintelligible or not uh, like a, by human terms or in humans understanding you know that that we have the gift of interpreting which is important like these tongues should be uh, uh, meant and used only for the building up of the church community and the faithful and those who are looking to become faithful right that's the importance uh, that's why uh, tongues are still part of the uh, ministry of the church when it's need when it's needed in those specific 
um, or those in, the, in those timely situations. And then finally, um, this last section, St. Paul highlights that these gifts are given as God wills and all cannot do all these same things. That's what we talked about the last part, can all be apostles or all be prophets, all be teachers or workers of miracles. Uh, no, all of us can, are not, we're given, the, like we said earlier, are given the gifts as, according to God's will. And then the final thing he says in that verse 31, uh, to, you know, to wrap up this chapter, exhorting us to be zealous for the greater gifts, uh, gifts that benefit, that uh, that help more people. That's what this, this, the greater gifts, that's what he's talking about, what is greater. And not ones that only edify oneself or plus one's ego. The greater gifts are those that are uh, more uh, uh, are greater. They are more surpassing. That is the more surpassing way. And then, as, as you know, that when you read chapter, uh, uh, begin chapter 13, we know the greatest of all the gifts is what? Love, which we'll talk about next time. But that's what saying. Without uh, being mindful that as much as we can have all these gifts and abilities that's given to us by the grace and mercies, of God and by his uh, endowing us with these uh, powers and gifts, you know, it's, it means nothing as we'll talk about next time without the love of God, right? And having godly love with us, right? And that, that's what we'll talk about next time. But being mindful as much as St. Paul is highlighting all these gifts and their uses and how they should properly be understood, you know, these are only, is a, this is only one part. We, not, not that we shouldn't be focusing and only on be receiving these things. Because like you said, it's not about oneself. It's about it's about um, um, it, it's about uh, um, sorry. It's about um, building up, right? Uh, the God, right? Not puffing up one's ego. Okay, that wraps up today's uh, presentation. Are there any questions um, or comments or clarifications? You guys can write in the chat, or you can. Achim, unmute could yourself. you please? Could you please send us the deck? the whole deck as itself along sure with... I can... okay I that would that. be that would be helpful thank you not okay. the youtube part of it but your I deck. The, 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 the the powerpoint slides i can send i can send a pdf for those okay thank you and i'll, I'll send a question one the good coordinators and i can email to all of you guys uh, to all of all of us and then we can try to put it also as maybe as a link on the youtube or on the diocesan website Any other questions? Let me see if there's one in the chat. Um, good question. Okay. Thank you, Susan. If not, we can wrap up. These are about five minutes before nine o'clock. And uh, we want to try to keep the time. So I went to get busy with other family things and getting ready for work the next day in the morning. Okay, let's close it. Coach, I think we're done for today. Gonna, we'll close in prayer if there's any announcements.